Good afternoon um, and welcome. I was going to say good morning, but we're a few minutes after 12. Um, thank you so much for spending the time to join us here at the Rockefeller Foundation. I wanted to welcome you to our new convening space. Uh, my name, for those who I haven't met, is Elizabeth Yee, and I am the Executive Vice President of Programs here at the Foundation. For those of you who don't know us, um, we've been around for 110 years. We just celebrated that birthday um, last year. And the thing that I'm really excited about is the first time in our history we have an all of RF strategy, um, which we launched at UNGA last fall, um, an entire climate strategy for our foundation. And what that means is it's our programmatic work focusing on climate, our operations and endowment all making net zero commitments because we believe right now that the only way to ensure that we advance the well-being of humanity is to address the most important threat focus facing us right now um, as a planet, and that is climate change. The, I was talking to Roddy um, and, and some of the some of our grantees earlier. You know, one of the things that is just so important to us is focusing that strategy on people. Um, it is it, we can't make a just transition. We can't live on this planet without thinking about people, and in particular, those who aren't represented in this room, those whose voices that we represent and have the privilege to do that. One of the things, um, having come from and spent about five years as an organization called 100 Resilient Cities, is the deep recognition that urban plays a critical role in this challenge. 80% of our communities right now in the United States live in cities. And it's going up to about 90% by 2050. And so to get this right, we have to focus on cities, which are so near and dear to all of us here. And so the importance of work like um, that you've been doing together as a community with the Menino Survey of Mayors is, is really important because it is the only national representative survey that enables mayors to have a collective combined voice to elevate and share the challenges facing them. And the survey is special to, to me personally for two reasons. Um, one, uh, that it is we, I get to stand here and say, this has been going on for 10 years, which is a huge milestone. So congratulations on your decade long anniversary. Um, and then second and most importantly, this latest survey helps us articulate the challenges that mayors are facing with the federal, the implementation of all of this incredible federal legislation that we have in the Inflation Reduction Act, IIJA, and CHIPS. And this all started, um, this survey started in 2014 thanks to the Initiative on Cities, which is at Boston University, uh, which, um, and for those who aren't familiar, it's, a, it's incredible. Global Urban Research Center um, and who launched the survey to make sure that mayors were represented at the table. And I think as, as a foundation, we've been very proud to represent that um, and support it for the last seven years. So it's on your chair right now, um, but for those who haven't read it, and I had a chance to read it before this, please do. The things that were staggering to me, and I was uh, sharing this with one of my colleagues, six in 10 mayors have said that the Inflation Reduction Act is too difficult. And 45% of them kind of reinforced that. That can't be the reality if we're trying to build a just and green future, if we're trying to take advantage of this unprecedented legislation that we have. And the fact that citizens don't understand it, don't understand how to access it, means that communities on the front line who really have a chance to be at the core of this and should not be left behind in this transition, can't be there. And so that's why I'm so grateful to all of you, grateful to the Boston University team and the Menino, Mayor survey, uh, Menino survey of Mayors team to make sure that this doesn't happen, to make sure that we are in fact supporting those people who need to have a chance and who need to be at the front and center of, of this transition. And so one of the things that we did um, as a foundation is we partnered uh, together with several other different foundations. Um, thanks to our, my colleague, Rachel Isikoff, who is leading that charge for us, um, we helped create something called the Invest in Our Future um, program. And that is all of us working together to try to change that paradigm, to make sure that communities who are counting on this, who deserve to be um, at the front and center of this, have a chance to do that. And that is also ensuring that cities are a key part of it. And so you'll hear today from several of our grantees and partners. I'm excited to hear your stories, which I've only gotten a snippet of before this. Um, I also 
wanted to share that we are very uh, proud to support Climate Mayors, which has been a key part of our work um, in the fight to make sure that we elevate and accelerate the implementation of these federal legislations. And I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Justin Bibb from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and the chair of Climate Mayors for helping ensure that this agenda is front and center for our country. And so with that, um, thank you for taking the time. Um, thank you for focusing on this important topic. And I wanted to welcome Catherine Levine Einstein and Maxwell Palmer, the associate professors of political science at Boston University who were key to authoring this report to share a little bit more about it. Thanks so much. Thank you to all of you for being here, um, and thank you to the Rockefeller Foundation both for hosting us and for supporting this survey for years. Um, um, doesn't look like it's advancing. Um, is there another clicker? Or we can, can we go next slide? Great, thank you. So we're really excited to share with you the latest results from the Menino Survey of Mayors, uh, which as the introduction said, is the only nationally representative survey of mayors. We started in 2014 at Boston University's Initiative on Cities. I cannot believe it's been a decade of doing this survey, um, and it's continued on for the last seven years with the generous support of the Rockefeller Foundation, my colleague Max Palmer, and another colleague, David Gluck, who could not be here today, um, are the co-principal investigators on this survey, and it would not be possible without the amazing Stacy Fox, who has just been integral in interviewing hundreds of mayors. Next slide. Um, so this year's survey features interviews with 118 mayors of cities over 75,000. It's a response rate of over 25%. We conduct all of our interviews either in person or over the phone. So the responses that you're going to see here today come directly from mayors. One of the really great things about doing these interviews over the phone or in person is that mayors are chatty. So they, they, they love to share their many opinions with us. So a lot of the questions we asked are technically like closed-ended multiple choice questions, but we get so many elaborations from them, which allow us to really get a sense of what they're thinking about these pressing issues. Um, this sample is a nationally representative sample along sort of all of the demographic lines that we might care about, including partisanship, region of the country, and so on. Next slide. Um, so the topics covered in this report, this was not just a report about the environment and the Inflation Reduction Act, though that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, we also asked about sort of accountability and control over local policies and public disorder. If those are things you're interested in, feel free to come chat with uh, Max and me afterwards, and we're happy to talk more about this. But for today, we're going to be focusing on mayor's views of the Inflation Reduction Act and permitting processes for things like clean energy infrastructure and housing. Next slide. So part of what really motivated us to dig deeply into the Inflation Reduction Act this year were some results from last year's survey, which suggests that mayors are deeply concerned about climate change across party lines. Right? When we look at the national political environment, there are often these incredibly sharp divides between Democrats and Republicans about how to tackle issues like climate change. When we looked at mayors, there are still partisan differences. We don't want to pretend that Democratic and Republican mayors are identical, but those differences are much more muted. Across region and across party, mayors are really eager to tackle climate change. Next slide. But we have some evidence that the Inflation Reduction Act, despite its ambition, despite the excitement about the passage of this act, may not be meeting the needs of local communities. So we asked mayors whether they perceived the Inflation Reduction Act as having a substantial impact on their communities. A majority said no. And so really for the remainder of the survey and the remainder of the report, what we want to understand is why this is the case. Why is it that mayors are not seeing this big impact from what is the largest investment in climate infrastructure that we've seen from the federal government in decades? Next slide. So we identify from our survey of mayors four key challenges that we believe help us to understand why it is that what is happening at the federal level, these huge investments, are not filtering down to our local communities. We identify low levels of local knowledge about IRA provisions, a lack of capacity to apply for IRA funding, an onerous local permitting processes and public opposition to built infrastructure, and local building codes and environmental regulations. 
Next slide. So starting with this issue of a lack of public knowledge, we asked mayors um, what they saw as the chief obstacles to uptake for things like solar panels and heat pumps. And overwhelming majorities of them, 68%, cited a lack of public knowledge about the provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. A smaller share of mayors in open-ended elaborations admitted that they themselves did not know about some of the provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. It is a complicated program, and the way that the grant structure is structured makes it difficult for members of the public and sometimes public officials to know what programs are out there. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, so 45% of mayors suggested that accessing the IRA's programs was difficult as compared to 38% who rated it as easy. And this was an open-ended question where mayors were able to sort of describe their grant application process. Um, and so some mayors said, oh, we've got amazing grants people on our team. I mean, anyone who has sort of worked in a nonprofit or government organization knows what it's like when you have someone on your team that is dedicated to applying for funding, right? So for mayors who have that kind of staff capacity, navigating the complex provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act is fairly straightforward. Um, for those who do not have staff who are available to do research into grants and grant applications and navigate all of the red tape, it is quite difficult. Next slide. And it turns out smaller cities are less likely to have those kinds of staff and those kinds of resources available. So smaller cities were 13 percentage points less likely to rate the process of accessing IRA resources as easy. And they explicitly cited not having that kind of grant writing capability. They simply do not have the resources to hire those kinds of staff. Next slide. A third issue that is really that causes local governments to struggle when implementing some of the IRA's provisions are permitting processes and community opposition, which are intricately linked. So building infrastructure, whether it is housing or clean energy infrastructure, requires homeowners, developers, or contractors to navigate complicated land use and construction regulations and requirements. So land use and zoning in most communities in the United States dictate things like project standards, what can be built and where it can be built. It also dictates, perhaps most importantly, the process by which a particular project is built. So some projects have very streamlined application processes. They're what we call by right developments, where maybe you submit your plans to a planning department or a city council, whatever the reviewing body is, and they either say yes or no. Um, most developments don't go that way. They require a special permit or a variance from existing zoning. And when you have to go through those types of permitting processes, you are vulnerable to public opposition because those types of permitting processes require public hearings and often can become quite lengthy and contentious. Next slide. And mayors in 2022, 2022, they recognized the importance of building codes and zoning as essential to addressing climate change. Right? So when we ask them which of the two are the most powerful potential tools for your city related to climate change, they highlighted those two policy areas. Next slide. They also recognize the potent role that community opposition might play in blocking much needed climate infrastructure. So we asked mayors for a series of different types of infrastructure projects, what would generate the most opposition? Multifamily housing, ground solar arrays, wind turbines, and transmission lines. And as you can see, some types of clean energy infrastructure mayors believe generate more opposition than housing. Um, one of our other research hats is actually studying opposition to housing. So I can tell you that people hate new housing, right? This is not something that anyone is like deeply supportive of when it is proposed next to them. We see this in public meetings. We see it in public opinion polls. So for mayors to say wind turbines and transmission lines, those are even harder than housing is a stark statement about just how hard it is to get clean energy infrastructure built in the United States. Next slide. Mayors also recognized 
at least somewhat the value of passing policies that might streamline the permitting process. And this is in the context of housing. We asked a few questions about streamlining the permitting process. So one area um, that mayors believe is sort of a good public policy, we um, cited a um, preemption law from California and Oregon that allows property owners to construct accessory dwelling units by right, so without going through a lengthy permitting process. A majority of mayors were supportive of this kind of state level preemption. But as I'll show you on the next slide, that support only goes so far. So, so mayors, when we asked them whether they would support preemption that would get rid of single family zoning and allow duplexes by right, were considerably less enthusiastic. So only a minority of mayors supported policies like that in their own communities. And here they emphasized um, concerns about local control. So mayors over and over again, when we sort of asked them, okay, why wouldn't you wanna see a policy like this in your community? They stressed they wanted to maintain control over land use. That's understandable, but it is going to make it really hard for federal programs like the Inflation Reduction Act to succeed if local governments retain tight control over restrictive land use. Next slide. Finally, I wanna to turn to fragmented building and electrical codes. So on top of doing this survey of mayors, we are really interested in this question of energy infrastructure. We also actually interviewed some solar contractors to get a sense of um, sort of what the experience was like for people who are trying to build this kind of clean energy infrastructure. And several solar companies told us about the problems that fragmented, or the fragmented regulatory environment pose. So solar companies that work across multiple jurisdictions or multiple states often encounter different building and environmental codes in every single jurisdiction they operate. That requires you to spend a lot of time learning the nitty gritty of potentially hundreds of different policy environments. Um, that makes it very costly to operate and may disincentivize companies from operating in certain jurisdictions. Next slide. And indeed, a few mayors recognize this problem. So some of the mayors that we talked to said that they worried that contractors didn't really understand the building codes in their community and that they wanted there to be less red tape um, and that environmental um, regulatory agencies needed to be better staffed and more streamlined in their permitting. Next slide. Some mayors even recognize that there is a trade-off between having more stringent environmental regulations on the books um, and actually accomplishing environmental goals. So some mayors noted that there are environmental regulations that actually stand in opposition to clean energy infrastructure and make it harder for us to accomplish some of our clean energy goals. Next slide. And perhaps nowhere were mayors more aware of this trade-off than in California. So when we asked open-ended questions about environmental regulations, you'd like to see change, perhaps unsurprisingly for people who are sort of steeped in this area, every single California mayor mentioned CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is notorious for being used as a tool for blocking multifamily housing. It has also been used sometimes to block clean energy infrastructure, things like solar arrays. Um, and so again, mayors, at least some of them, are aware of these trade-offs between the environmental regulations on the books and accomplishing actual clean energy goals. Next slide. But like with zoning, mayors also like their local control. So when we asked them whether it might be preferable to standardize things like building codes and environmental regulations at the state level, an overwhelming majority of mayors said, we would like to retain local control. And so this is going to be a real challenge if we think about how to make things easier for the clean energy um, in builders, right, who are integral to the success of the Inflation Reduction Act. This affection for local control among our public officials is going to be a big obstacle. Next slide. So from this report, we come up with a few different policy recommendations. We think we need better communication of IRA provisions and opportunities both to local government and to individual households. We think there needs to be more support for local governments, especially smaller communities, to navigate these complicated grant programs. Um, we'd like to see reforms to the regulatory process that create opportunities for vocal opponents to stop and delay climate infrastructure projects. And we'd like 
expect to see a standardization of local permitting processes, zoning and land use regulations, and building codes. Next slide. So with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Max Palmer, who's going to talk to you a little bit about 10 years of the Menino survey. All right, thank you. I just want to take a couple minutes and reflect on that we've completed now 10 years of this survey and share a little bit about who we've interviewed in that time. Um, next slide. So we've conducted over 1,000 interviews, 1,121 interviews with mayors. Next. And that's 491 different mayors across the country, uh, 382 different cities, and that represents mayors in 45 states. And across those, uh, next please, that's more than 60% of all the eligible cities, those cities with at least 75,000 people across the country, and uh, next. And in fact, 80% of the 50 biggest cities in the country. And that's why this is largely due to the incredible efforts of Stacey Fox, the executive director of the Dish Fund Cities, who has to reach out to the offices of all these mayors and get them to participate. And then we talk to them on the phone or at conferences and we're really grateful for all their participation over the years. We've asked 723 different questions uh, with a couple repeats in here, uh, and that includes over 75,000 different answers. So this is a huge amount of really valuable data, and Katie and I and our colleague David have been lucky to write a lot with this data and publish on it, but there's a lot of other questions we haven't yet been able to answer. Uh, next slide. So today we're releasing, along with the report, a new data portal. Uh, which you can find at surveyofmayors.com slash data. And here we've put every multiple choice uh, question we've asked mayors over the entire 10 year period. And you can download the results. You can split them out by things like city size or mayoral partisanship or housing costs or lots of other demographic factors you might be interested in looking at differences on. You can get the raw data uh, as well. And so we're making this public in the hopes that researchers, policymakers, others interested in the results of the survey and all the valuable things that mayors have told us uh, will use this data and learn from it and uh, hopefully share those results back with us as well. Uh, with that, we're going to turn things over to Ryan Whalen. Uh, Ryan is a special assistant to the president and senior advisor for implementation, leading state and local coordination for the Inflation Reduction Act. Ryan joined the Biden Harris administration from Bloomberg Philanthropies, where he launched the local infrastructure hub a national platform that has empowered more than 1,200 communities across the country to leverage the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act. And he also co-led the American Cities Climate Challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, back on with so many uh, friendly and familiar faces. Um, I'd be remiss um, just to add to the end of that uh, thoughtful introduction that I spent uh, more than five years at the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, I'm so sad that I can't be there in person um, to see this fantastic new convening space. Congratulations to Liz and the whole Rockefeller team um, for um, at first your support of the Menino survey, um, but also for uh, the incredible work that uh, is happening at the foundation and uh, 110 years um, of delivering for the well-being of humanity. I'll also acknowledge and thank the team at Boston University and the Initiative on Cities. Um, the work that you were doing really is field leading and provides a really powerful contribution to um, our understanding of America's mayors, um, their, um, their priorities and how they are delivering for their residents. And um, as a Boston kid who interned in City Hall under Mayor Tom Menino, um, I think the Menino survey continues to be um, a really powerful testament uh, to the legacy of Mayor Menino, his commitment to the role in the office of the mayor, um, and, uh, and all that he did uh, to not only deliver for Boston, but inspire mayors um, around the country and around the world. So congratulations on 10 years of the Menino survey being um, the best of the best. Um, so I am Ryan Whalen, um, and I spend my time helping state and local leaders around the country understand what the Inflation Reduction Act is, how it works, and what they can do uh, to uh, use it to deliver for their communities. I joined the administration last fall, and the results that you're seeing in the survey 
are familiar to me from um, what I um, what I heard when I connected with mayors and other state and local leaders about their understanding of the IRA and uh, what it might mean for them. And that was a big part of why I was brought into the administration and a number of others have since joined to really be focused on the specific task of not only standing up the, the many programs in the IRA, but making sure that all of the stakeholders who have the opportunity to benefit from it um, know that it's there and what it can do for them. And uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, I think as this room knows and understands, is the uh, single biggest investment um, in climate in the world's history. And it's a really profound set of uh, investments and tools that um, create the opportunity to significantly uh, accelerate the clean energy revolution. And importantly, um, this uh, the IRA is a uh, government-enabled but private sector-led um, approach to kickstarting clean energy investment. And we're seeing that uh, really it's working. Uh, since the president took office, over $365 billion in clean energy investments have been announced, supporting uh, 270,000 uh, plus uh, jobs newly created um, uh, through these clean energy investments. And also through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, America is back on track to uh, reach its emissions reduction targets. But even in this uh, incredibly important and profound uh, investment, there are um, uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that all stakeholders, stakeholders can understand where they fit into it. And the Inflation Reduction Act is different than the other parts of the Investing in America agenda in some important ways. The American Rescue Plan, in many ways, local government's best friend, providing the flexible and powerful resources that local governments needed to begin their response and recovery efforts. The bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, competitive and formula grants that allow states and local governments and others to deliver on their infrastructure priorities. The IRA, while it certainly has a number of different grant programs, two thirds of the resources in the IRA run through the tax code. And what that means is that not only are there a suite of opportunities for the private sector uh, to leverage these, uh, these uh, tax incentives to deliver those $365 billion plus in clean energy investments, but there actually are this uh, really large set of new opportunities for the public sector and for nonprofits to access those resources for the first time. Um, there's also this very large set of consumer incentives and, uh, and opportunities that are available um, in many cases for the first time. And so the, uh, what we see in the survey um, is that there's a real opportunity to make sure that mayors and others um, know what these opportunities are um, for their community. And that's what I and my colleagues have been working on. Uh, just yesterday, I was with uh, 20 mayors from smaller cities in Ohio, talking to them about uh, the inflation reduction and direct pay in particular. Um, I was uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and Mayor Gallego convened a roundtable of a number of different stakeholders from across the greater Phoenix area to help them understand what the IRA is, and in particular, what this new uh, tool of direct pay is and how it works. We had uh, local governments, we had county governments, we had tribal communities, we had nonprofits, the community college, uh, school districts, uh, nonprofits, and more all together because every single one of them can benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. And there are fundamentally new tools that they are learning about for the first time, and we were there to help educate them about that. I was then on an electric bus in Tucson, Arizona with Mayor Regina Romero. Um, and taking that electric bus to the park that uh, is benefiting from the urban and community forestry grant program that the city of Tucson had won to expand their Million Trees initiative. Um, and so we're seeing that so many different mayors are seeing the opportunities and beginning to take those up. Uh, I was with Mayor Bibb and the climate mayor's team here in Washington uh, just recently um, and at a round table talking with other climate mayor's members about the opportunities in the IRA for electric vehicles um, and so many more engagements like that that we are doing. We are in a perpetual effort to make sure that um, mayors and other local leaders and stakeholders know what the IRA is and how it works for them. Um, I also want to make sure to, to say that not only are a lot of these investments happening um, uh, across the country, but they're also showing up in the communities that uh, can use those investments the most. 
Uh, many of you may have seen the study that came out of the Treasury Department at the end of last year that found that um, of the clean energy investments that are uh, that are happening here in the U.S., 81% um, of those investment dollars are uh, in counties with um, below average wages. 86% are landing in counties with below average college graduation rates. 7% uh, in counties where a smaller share of the population is employed. Um, and 78% um, uh, in counties with below average median household incomes. So um, while there still is so much that we need to do um, around um, education and understanding of the IRA, the IRA is also landing in communities in some, some really important and exciting ways. Um, while we're here, I want to touch on a couple of points just to make sure the room fully understands the suite of opportunities that are available to mayors um, and their communities. Um, and when I think about it, there are uh, a number of different ways that, um, that mayors can think about their role in leveraging the IRA. There are the ways that local governments directly can be applying for uh, a number of different grants. Um, although for this group's uh, point of reference, many of the grants in the Inflation Reduction Act largely run their course um, um, by the end of 2024, whereas the tax credits um, in many cases last for a decade. Um, and so uh, not only can mayors be pursuing the grant programs, but they can be using the, the uh, mechanisms in direct pay up through 2032. And so there's a real opportunity there for local governments uh, to, be, um, to be accessing this funding, not just right now and not just through a competitive program, uh, but for years to come. Then there's the opportunity to be um, serving as an enabler and an ambassador, convening local institutions, like the example I provided in Phoenix, uh, to help all these different, institution, different institutions understand uh, what this means for them. Marketing the uh, programs that are directly for consumers to their residents. I think about Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway in Wisconsin, um, who, uh, along with local partners, um, uh, is running uh, a door to door campaign to help uh, the residents in her city understand all of the consumer opportunities that are available um, for residents to make home energy efficiency upgrades um, and more. And we're hearing from many other mayors who are building up similar efforts to bring those uh, directly to uh, residents' uh, doorsteps and, and homes. Um, and then also understanding what these tax credits mean for the companies in, um, in the cities these mayors represent and the way as part of their thoughtful, smart economic development strategies, they can be creating the, um, the right settings and the right enabling environment for companies that are leveraging these tax credits to show up in, in their cities. There's also a great opportunity for mayors to be partnering with their county and state governments on many of these projects as well. Um, I'll, I'll spend just a moment to highlight a couple of features of direct pay and some of the consumer opportunities before I wrap up here, just to make sure this room fully understands what some of those are. Um, for those who closely follow um, the issuance of Treasury and IRS regulations, uh, you might have seen that um, on Tuesday of this week, the Treasury Department issued final guidance on uh, direct pay or elective pay. This is the mechanism in the Inflation Reduction Act that brings the tax credits that historically the private sector has leveraged to the public and nonprofit sectors. And so now uh, local governments, nonprofits, universities, hospitals, uh, houses of worship, and so many other entities now have access to 12 different tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. And with these regulations finalized, uh, uh, local governments and others beginning with projects put into service in 2023, are able to file with the IRS to receive tax credits, uh, sometimes on the order of 30, 40, and 50 percent, depending on the specifics and the locations of the project, um, uh, to receive significant credits back for those investments that they might be making in uh, clean transportation, clean buildings, and more. And um, this is a completely new opportunity I think about the, the, some of the statistics in the report, and this is the first time ever that direct pay is available to local government or anyone else. And the regulations were just finalized on Tuesday and uh, entities have the opportunity to file just now. So for direct pay, this is a fundamentally new tool that is really powerful. And with 10 years of certainty, local governments and others can put this into their capital planning process and, head and understand the ways this will allow them to go further and faster on their clean energy uh, priorities um, and investments. Now, 
Um, in addition for, for direct pay, um, there's, a, there's an opportunity there where not only can local governments be using it, but the university system, hospitals, and others, school districts can be. And so there's a chance for mayors to really work with them to make sure they understand these opportunities and take advantage of them. Um, we are excited about direct pay, I think, as one of, you know, across the investing in America agenda. This is one of the newest and most powerful tools that are in there, and we know that this will help local governments um, deliver um, on their clean energy ambitions in a really new way. I'll also mention the consumer benefits that are out there. Um, there are a combination of both federal tax incentives, the kinds of things that you would use when you, uh, an individual would be filing uh, for their personal taxes, and also a set of uh, home energy efficiency rebates. The federal tax credits are um, online and available, and people who are filing their taxes right now for um, uh, for, for uh, purchases they made in 2023 are able to start taking advantage of those. But in addition, the rebates um, at point of sale at places like Home Depot and Lowe's and others, um, those are um, uh, the first four states are going through the process to bring this online. The rebates programs uh, run through state energy offices, um, but already California, New York, New Mexico, and Hawaii have put in their final plans to the Department of Energy, and their rebate programs will be coming with more to come throughout the rest of the year. And so a whole new set of opportunities will be available for consumers, and this is another opportunity for mayors to be promoting these to their residents. All that to say, um, you know, the, the opportunity for local government and for mayors in the IRA is profound. It is a also full of a bunch of fundamentally new tools, and we are committed here at the administration to making sure that um, every mayor and other elected official in America knows and understands what these are, how they work, and how they can bring them to life uh, for the residents. Um, BU, thank you for your research and your focus and your commitment to mayors. Thank you for elevating these insights. Rockefeller, thank you for your funding and hosting. Um, and with that, back to the program. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, folks. My name is Raddy. I'm with the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm with the Economic Equity Team and or equity and economic opportunity team. Um, so our team is really tasked with both securing and unlocking dollars for federal government uh, federal government investments into the communities. Um, as you heard from Liz earlier, that involves our work with IOF, um, which is really unlocking IRA dollars um, and that flow into communities. Our work with um, tax and policy work, and also our work with the Economic Opportunity Coalition, which is a cross-sector uh, partnership that's being incubated within the Rockefeller Foundation to unlock uh, federal investments um, within the Invest in America agenda more broadly. And that said, I am going to introduce some folks to join me to the stage today. And let's start with uh, some folks that are in the room while we get um, some folks that are going to be joining us virtually as well. So Michelle Roos, thank you for joining us today. I invite you to join me up on stage. Uh, Michelle is the executive director um, of, of, oh my God. Of Environmental Protection Network. Don't do that to me. I just saw you. I looked at you and you locked eyes. It was a booming. Anyway, so thank you. So um, thank you. And then I know Jamal is also in the room. And Jamal is the Director of State and Local Policy for the Mid-Atlantic South um, at Rewiring America. Awesome. Thank you. Can we give him a hand for Jamal? Thank you. Right, thank, you. thank you. And then Mayor Bibb, I see you're able to join us virtually. Thank you for taking the time to connect with us today. And let's start with a, with a round of introductions. Uh, Mayor Bibb, you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mayor Justin Bibb of the great city of Cleveland, Ohio. For folks that don't know, uh, John D. Rockefeller started Standard Oil in Cleveland and got his start here in Cleveland. So it's a special honor and privilege to be here today to talk about all the work America's mayors are doing to make the promise of environmental and climate justice real. So happy to be here this afternoon. All right, Jamal? Yeah, hi. Um, Jamal Lewis, actually have a new title. Uh, it's Director of Implementation Learning and Integration. Uh, and basically what that means, I'm working to help uh, implement our electrification programming uh, as we kick that off. Um, but I will say, Mayor Bibb, I went to Cleveland for the first time for my birthday, actually, uh -oh. I, went, I went skiing at Cuyahoga Valley National Park. 
got a great city going on there. Great to hear, man. Got to come see us again soon. We'll do. <laughs> and Michelle. Yes. Hi. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so I don't know how I feel about uh -oh. Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> go Browns. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, yeah. Anyway, yeah, Michelle Roos, I'm the executive director of the Environmental Protection Network. I actually physically live here in New York now. Um, and our organization, we're a tiny 501c nonprofit, and we have a volunteer network of over 650 EPA alum that are fully committed to seeing that these funds benefit disadvantaged communities. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's get the conversation started. And Mayor Bibb, I know you joined us last year for the release of the Menino Report as well uh, with our colleague Rachel Isakov as well. So thank you for joining us this year as well. And, you know, local governments really understand what's at stake when we talk about climate change, right? Local communities are really feeling the real and immediate impacts of climate change and what's going on in, in communities. So we'd love to hear from you um, specifically, as IRA is, you know, it's a federal law, but it's a local policy too, essentially, right? So, mm -hmm. how are you all in the city of, in the great city of Cleveland, um, taking advantage and leveraging what's going on with the IRA um, to accelerate clean energy adoption and reduction of greenhouse emissions? Yeah, you know, I, I'm really happy about uh, this study because it really shows you uh, the challenge we have as mayors and really making sure that these historic federal investments can really improve the everyday lived experiences of the residents that we serve every single day. And so when I think about, you know, how we in Cleveland and other cities across the country are thinking about these investments, what we're really focused on is how do we make sure our residents feel these investments and feel connected to these investments? So I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, uh, we're really focused on making sure we can really lower the energy costs for many of our residents across uh, the city of Cleveland because we are the second poorest big city in the country and one of the most energy burdened cities in the country as well, too. And so we're trying to be creative with the private sector to extend the benefits of solar panels on homes, particularly in black and brown neighborhoods in Cleveland to help lower the energy burden for those residents. Because if they can spend 50% less or 60% less on their energy bills, that's more money that goes into their 401k. That's more money to start a business. That's more money for childcare. So making those kind of connections. I would also say as mayors, we have a, a special role and responsibility uh, to be the conveners uh, and chief in our respective cities. And so uh, we are trying to leverage our convening power to bring our county government together, our state government together, and the private sector together so that the private sector understands how to maximize uh, these historic federal investments from the Inflation Reduction Act. Because when I talk to companies, either small companies or large companies, quite frankly, many don't know how to navigate the tax credit and the financing tools available through the IRA. And so it's about connecting the dots with all the key stakeholders, but it's also about translation, translation, translation. And so when I'm talking about the IRA, do I, I barely mention the words Inflation Reduction Act, but what we talk about are the real policy solutions we're trying to deploy to improve the everyday uh, lived experiences of our residents. I appreciate that. And, you know, you both have the perspective of being the mayor of Cleveland and as the chair of climate mayor. So, you know, I appreciate you also sharing some of that, um, what you're seeing uh, throughout throughout your other colleagues um, throughout the country. Um, we'd like to turn to Michelle and Jamal and hear um, how you all are seeing um, other communities benefiting from the IRA so far. Sure, happy to go first. Um, so everywhere in America, uh, we are uh, laser focused on transitioning our economy to an all electric economy, recognizing that that is uh, the most efficient and effective way of reducing our country's emissions. Uh, we have an opportunity, the collective we, the proverbial we, have an opportunity to make different choices in our lives, um, to choose efficient electric machines like heat pumps, like electric vehicles that 
in aggregate can make a really big difference on our country's emissions. The Inflation Reduction Act provides a lot of resources to help people do that. A lot of consumer facing resources like the tax credits that Ryan was talking about earlier, the consumer uh, rebates uh, that were also mentioned. Uh, but all of that, you know, the, the impact of that is dependent on whether or not people know that these resources are out there. And so that's why I'm really excited um, to know that there's this Menino survey did a survey of mayors uh, and found that there's, you know, there's more work to, to be done. Uh, and we, we've known that, but this provides some real data uh, to show that. At Rewiring America, we are focused on helping people understand the resources that are available to them. So that includes uh, our homes at rewiringamerica.org website. It's a consumer site uh, helping people understand what electrification is, uh, what those technologies are that they can leverage in their lives to, to lower their energy costs, um, to improve the efficiency of their homes, but also the resources that are available through the Inflation Reduction Act to help them do that. Uh, so we, we have a calculator on our website that helps connect people to the tax credits. And we are also working on state-specific calculators, incentive calculators. So effectively, you know, most states have utility programs or other state-based programs that also help people improve the efficiency of their homes. We're pairing that with the IRA calculator so that anyone who takes who anyone who goes to the site and is interested in making improvements can see not only the IRA incentives that they're eligible for but also the state-based incentives that they're eligible for too um, and which can be stacked together bringing down the cost um, even further so we have that tool and then the last thing I'll say before I kick it over to Michelle is that we launched a personal electrification planner tool so anyone who is interested in making uh, those choices in their lives can view, uh, we call it PEP, can go insert some information about yourself, about your home, and it'll map out what your electrification journey looks like. So we're really laser focused on helping people understand what this transition means, what it means for them, and how uh, they can take the next steps to achieve it. Thank you. I'm going to use some of those uh, resources for myself. Uh, yeah, so how our organization is approaching this magical moment, and we know it is a magical moment because, again, I'm an EPA alum. We have hundreds of EPA alum. We recognize that this is this might never happen again, and it's definitely never happened before. And so even when this was just a, a, a hope that this administration would create such an opportunity, we began to mobilize. Um, so we launched our pro bono capacity building technical assistance program about three years ago. And since then, we've received almost 800 individual requests for technical assistance. About half of those come from the nonprofit sector, about half from municipalities, tribes, state government, and sometimes even federal government. Um, it is it is overwhelming, and as the mayor mentioned, you know, translation, translation, translation. If there's one thing that our staff and certainly our alumni network are is fluent in bureaucracy. Um, so what we try to do is four major things, and I send out a lot of emails, as, uh, as our friends at Emerald Cities know. Um, we send out about every two weeks comprehensive guides on what we think are some of the most promising opportunities for federal funding. Some of that includes, you know, hey, they just finalized all the direct pay regulations, or what we do is we create step-by-step -step processes on how to apply for funding. So my colleague, um, Kathy, she takes a 75, 80-page notice of funding opportunity and translates that into six steps with templates and checklists and a timeline. Um, it's a lot of work <laughs> to pull that together, but hopefully saves people a tremendous amount of time. The kind of the next, and that goes out to thousands and thousands of people. And if you really want to upset my staff slash make them really proud of me, you can go on to our website environmentalprotectionnetwork.org and sign up to get these updates, which are easily forwarded to anybody. Um, 
So in addition to sending out those very robust uh, emails equipped with a lot of tools that folks can use, we also uh, show up anywhere. So we have staff all across the country, so we'll show up to panels or webinars or go to a school or go to a mayor's office or who, and, and, and talk through any number of opportunities that they might be exploring. And we come with these volunteers with 20, 30, 40 years of experience in federal government. Um, we've recognized that uh, office hours are very powerful right now. And actually the IRS is doing amazing office hours right now on direct pay where you can come and say, oh, on this form, like subsection Q, number three, and they'll like whip it up and talk through it. So like we, we saw folks doing office hours and we recognize that that's a great way to just help folks get over the finish line. Um, for all this federal funding, this might not be as relevant for municipalities, but definitely nonprofits. They have to register with the federal government on different websites to show that they can get into a financial agreement. And that all has to happen before you apply. And matter of fact, if you haven't done that, you can't even submit your application for some funding. So we drag people through the grants.gov and sams.gov registration process, and we feel very good when we've made it to the finish line. And the very last thing that we do is one-on-one -on -one support. So, you know, we spent our careers at EPA, you know, building tools that maybe people didn't use or passing regulations that got really confusing later. There is, it's a gift to us to be able to meet communities exactly where they are and help them through their self-defined journey. We do national policy advocacy. That doesn't mean we can't help a municipality go uh, advocate for a different solution to their problem. Our feeling is that the more information that's out there, the better solutions um, will transpire. And so that one-on-one -on -one work is um, really the bread and butter of what we do. And every time we get a new question, we learn something new. And then we're able to pass that on um, to others. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bibb, I'm going to turn back over your way. Uh, you know, we've spoken today about individual incentives, and we know that the more folks that take advantage of some of these incentives for solar, heat pumps, um, just within your community are better for your city, right? Um, so we'd love to hear about steps that your city is taking to educate people about uh, the IRA and how they can actually take advantage of that, um, and generally just adopting climate-friendly technologies. Yeah, so uh, really stealing from uh, one of our uh, former chairs of climate mayors, uh, Mayor Rhodes uh, Conway in Madison, it's old school grassroots community engagement from knocking on doors, talking to residents about uh, the tax credits that are available through this historic federal legislation uh, to convening uh, key community influencers and stakeholders. Uh, on a quarterly basis, I meet with a group of black environmental uh, activists to talk about our climate justice agenda and how we can really make sure that everyone is a part of what we're doing at the local level. And then I would also say a part of the community that we haven't done a good enough job in engaging with is the faith-based community. Uh, because in many parts of our uh, cities, I don't care if it's in Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Los Angeles, you know, the faith-based community is really the front door of resources and opportunities for a lot of folks in terms of how they're accessing uh, good uh, public policy supports. And so uh, we wanna make sure we have a broad coalition uh, to address this. And I wanna just kind of talk about why this is important. Uh, I was speaking to a, another mayor on the East Coast and they were really excited about this brand new green energy efficient building. They were moving hundreds of residents too. And there was one resident who refused to leave her old apartment in a housing project. And the biggest reason why she wouldn't go to this new green energy efficient building was because the new building had an electric stove and the old building had a gas stove. And she was in charge of the Sunday uh, brunch and dinner at her church. And she didn't know how to cook greens on an electric stove. So these are the kind of things we have to think through as we talk about this transition 
and, and really do a better job of bringing residents along the entire way. Thank you. Uh, Jamal, um, can you piggybacking on, you know, working with cities, can you, can you speak about ways that Rewiring America is really partnering with cities and mayors um, and working to, to address these issues? Yeah. Whoa, that was loud. Got excited. Uh, still excited. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot to partner with cities. Uh, we have a, um, a local government leaders coalition uh, that um, helps to connect local government leaders to various resources um, on energy efficiency, on electrification, on uh, incentives, on the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, all types of things, policy ideas. Um, and we have coalesced all of that into a uh, resource hub on our website, too. It's the Local Government Leaders Resource Hub, I believe, uh, which compiles all of that. So anyone who uh, is interested in advancing something at the local level can go to that, that hub and find things that might be interesting to you. Um, we also uh, we partner with other um, entities, uh, nonprofits that work with local government leaders, too. Uh, I know that C40 cities in the room, USDN, um, others, I'm sure, Environmental Protection Network also. And um, recognizing that uh, because, you know, given the findings in this report, there's never enough support, you know, for local government leaders. And so we try our best to partner uh, and provide uh, some of that support to fill the gaps that exist in the uh, um, in this industry. Uh, but we also just do a bunch of consumer education too. Um, you know, our consumer resource, our uh, consumer hub on our website just has a ton of ton of information about what it means to go electric. And you know, I'm so happy that you shared that story, uh, Mayor Bibb. Uh, and one of the things you could tell uh, this resident or the mayor to tell this resident. <laughs> is that uh, it's just, it's way more efficient. We, we get that there's a barrier uh, with um, familiarity uh, and you know there's a connection that people feel uh, to their gas stoves. But I think that with enough um, engagement, with enough, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? With enough um, exposure uh, to these new technologies um, that people will start to realize that yeah, maybe it's not so bad. You know, we, we can do things in uh, that more efficiently, which saves more time and all of that good stuff. So it's it's something that we are really focused on is, is increasing exposure to some of these technologies and, and um, closing that knowledge gap uh, for people that I know has been talked about uh, a number of times today. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like one of the themes today is that it is an all hands on deck approach and everyone in the ecosystem is playing their part to advance the work. And with that, actually, we'd like to double click a little and uh, Michelle hear from you. I know you mentioned working with cities and working with even um, Emerald Cities Collaborative in their ways and like just, uh, just speaking a little more about that, um, how you collaborate with some of the other partners in the ecosystem to really advance the work cohesively. Sure, I think we collaborate, collaborate desperately and urgently. Um, it's an insane amount of information that's coming down the pike. And I can say this because I don't work for EPA anymore. Um, this money's not coming out in a reasonable pace or in a reasonable order. But it's coming out because it's got to be allocated by October. This is very, very vulnerable. Everything is very, very vulnerable. And so... As a result, we have to find other people that know what they're doing in this little sliver and that little sliver if we both want to meet communities where they are, make this a transformational moment in terms of equity, and also do things that you know have never been done before. Cool. Um, so we're very, very open. We tell people to take our information and put their logo on it if they'd like. We'll show up, like I said, to whatever we're invited to. Um, we're lucky. Our volunteers don't have ego in the game. They just want to show up and add value, and they do it very quietly. So one of the things that I was thinking about, like looking at some of the partners were, that are in the room, we're all trying to navigate a space 
where folks that maybe didn't get along before need to work together mm. to get money and see that it's invested in the right way. And so some of the most magical things that I've seen our volunteers and staff do is to support community groups. And when I say community groups, sometimes we call them three moms sitting around a kitchen table, right? Mm. It's just, or two people from a neighborhood association, whatever it is, people who are suffering, who care deeply about their children and their community and want to see that this funding is right. And then some, you know, fancy city person or state person says, oh, great, I'd like to put you on this application yeah. to just empower those folks to show up and feel like they can advocate very confidently for their desired outcomes. Um, and again, we don't show up to those meetings with the partners. We prepare the community uh, to, to show up. And um, I'm not going to be able to wrap this neatly in a bow because it's just messy work. Um, and uh, But yeah, we're super grateful for everybody that we get to work with that has so much knowledge and experience that we can work together. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to turn to the audience. This is my signal to you to get your questions ready. So this is open to anyone on the panel, but would like to hear um, how you want or how you would ideally see philanthropy and private sector show up to support this type of work. Um, because as we said, it is all hands on deck and th that includes ourselves in, the philan in, in philanthropy as well. So how can we be the most helpful in this time? I got some ideas. Um, I would say a couple things. One, capacity building. Uh, as a report laid out, a lot of uh, medium sized and smaller cities don't have a team of grant makers, uh, don't have the best K Street lobbyists in DC to navigate the complexities of all this historic federal investment. And so uh, the best thing philanthropy can do is really make sure that medium sized cities and smaller sized cities have the capacity and technical assistance and knowledge to really navigate uh, these important federal investments. I think the second thing I would say, um, we need some real funding to invest in narrative change work on the ground. Um, and you know, sometimes it's hard for a mayor to spend uh, their time uh, doing that narrative change work. And this is where I think you know, investing in grassroots community organizations, the faith-based community, labor, et cetera, and help them talk about what these investments mean and how they're impacting communities gives us the cover we need to really aggressively pursue uh, these types of investments. Yeah, and then I'll let you neatly wrap this in a bow like you did before. <laughs> um, yeah, I, capacity build. I just will emphasize capacity building. Uh, local government leaders need capacity, uh, but it's not just them. Again, it's it's community-based organizations. It's um, states need capacity too. The way that the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure law are set up is that a lot of it is going to states. Some of it's going to local governments. Some of it is going directly to community groups. And I know that Environment Protection Network, uh, Emerald Cities, also focuses on uh, helping both local government and community-based groups. But if a city or a jurisdiction is going to bring as much money to its, you know, to its jurisdiction as possible, it's going to require the state, it's going to require a partnership between the state, local governments in that area, and community groups within that area. And they all need capacity. So figuring out ways to provide support to, um, to those entities directly or, or indirectly through intermediaries that are more focused on preparing these entities to like uplift their own ideas as opposed to imposing ideas on them. Like I think that is the type of structure and support that's needed right now. Yes, <laughs> I 100% agree. Um, during this magical moment, it would not be such a bad idea to spend down. Mm. Spend down more than you intended to spend would be advice that I would have for philanthropy. Don't hold on to these resources for some 
potential future moment now. Number two, as Jamal mentioned, get as much unrestricted general operating support to community-based organizations. If they use that money to hire a grant writer, fantastic. An air monitoring expert, fantastic. A private entity that's gonna build solar in their local church, fantastic. Don't make it hard, make it as easy as possible. This is a high risk, high probability of really wonderful things happening moment. And I wouldn't be overly concerned if a couple of investments don't work out exactly how you thought. Um, I think thirdly, um, this was a theory we had three years ago before this money was real in any way. We are a small nonprofit. I am the CEO, the CFO, the COO. I don't have a degree in finance. I ran a federal grants program at EPA, but I'm not an expert per se in grants. I think that philanthropy has really, really smart and talented staff. And if possible, to lend some of those staff out to do things. So if you have a CFO, have them spend some percentage of their time helping your grantees manage federal funds. If you have a COO, have them spend a portion of their time helping tiny groups that are getting unprecedented kinds of funding figure out how they're gonna build from a really talented, excited champion to an organization that's going to be able to last, you know, for decades. Um, also, just you've you've got people that review grants all the time. Have them review grants. So again, that was a, that was an idea that we had a long time ago. Um, we've seen it happen, particularly with community foundations lending out some of their staff and expertise, and it's and it's. Uh, it's effective, and I think it builds the communities that we want to see, you know, long term. Awesome, thank you. And Mayor Bib, I saw your message in the chat, so welcome. Uh, closing remarks from you, and then we're going to stick around to get some questions from the audience, and then you all can bring us back with a nice bow at the end. Great. So, Mayor Bib. Well, first again, I want to just say thank uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Menino Institute for having me here. Uh, this afternoon uh, and you know I'll be headed to Miami uh, this week to host climate mayors at the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference and we'll be talking about this topic as well as the topic of how we make sure that we have a work wealth and wages agenda when it comes to this green uh, transformation but I think all of us not just mayors not just leaders in philanthropy but everybody in our community has a moral obligation to spread the gospel about these important investments. Because if we don't, uh, we're gonna miss this moment and hopefully the president will echo that tonight in the State of the Union. So again, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to seeing everybody soon. Take care, go Cavs. All right, great. So with that, I would like to turn it to the audience and let's see what questions we have. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm from uh, NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress. Um, and one area that I've been hearing about is public engagement is important, as well as communication. Um, can you say more about the data that informs your work? Um, what team is leading that, as well as how are you translating those metrics to your public? Um, for example, yes climate change is really real and they may feel and understand that but the bottom line is that if they were to transition they may have to be expected to pay more um, and green gentrification is often a contentious topic um, between the public and private developments um, and also if you can say more about uh, how are you you know encouraging them to go green and we and they're aware of these resources, 
but it still takes time out of their day. Sure. I'm trying to be less excited that time. <laughs> um, great question. And we, uh, a lot of our work is data driven. Uh, we have spent going on two years, a year and a half, um, putting together a tool called the Cube. Uh, it is a, um, it's a, it's a bunch of data that spits out um, information like uh, what, what what your upfront costs would look like to, to transition, um, what your energy bills um, would look like after you transition. There's a lot more information in there, but we built that based on uh, both publicly available data through um, resources like the, the National Labs, um, through the resources and data from the Department of Energy, um, from local data. And that is helping to inform, that is the backbone behind the personal electrification planner tool that I mentioned earlier. And so anyone who is going through that process will get to see what that looks like for them. Uh, and you know, this is a all hands on deck approach. So consumers, like I said, like I started, you know, this um, panel, consumers have the power to make your own choices about the types of machines they use to heat and, heat and, cool, heat and cool your home and water, um, what you cook your food on, what you drive, if you drive. Um, and at the same time, there are other environmental factors um, and not in the, like the traditional sense, but in, like po political and policy factors that impact one's experience doing that. So we also have, like our policy team is working with the federal government, working with states and local governments, uh, like I mentioned, but on the state side, working with regulatory agencies, like public service commissions, public utility commissions to ensure that um, there are friendlier rate, rate programs for people who are switching uh, and that anyone who does switch does not see an increase in bills. So that is like the data driven piece, but communicating all of this is important too. And it's important to, to meet people where they are. You know, that's something that has been talked about quite a bit here. Um, and setting expectations too. Like, what does it mean uh, when you transition? What does it mean uh, for your family? What does it mean for your energy consumption? What does it mean for your energy usage? Um, are there other resources that we can connect you to to help lower your, your costs? Um, so solar, are there community solar programs in your area? Is it possible that you, that you yourself could could get community solar? Can your affordable housing or your multifamily apartment building get connected to solar, like or geothermal or other types of energy production um, that can continue to drive costs down? But all of this is is such a dynamic and delicate um, effort that it really takes um, continuing to learn as we go, but also doing as uh, as much of the uh, also informing as much if we as much as we do with um, data that's out there like polling, um, uh, energy cost data, all of that. So learning as we go, being delicate, uh, being deliberate also though um, to make sure because like we this is urgent too. This is this is an urgent situation that we're in in terms of spending down dollars before October. But also you know we are in a climate crisis and whether or not that resonates with people, um, we do have to meet. Uh, sort of like the pace of progress that we need to meet in order to secure like a healthy future for our, our kids, our grandkids. I also don't have grandkids, so, or kids. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Mishka Mitchell with Emerald Cities Collaborative, and a few of uh, the attendees uh, before the event started were talking about the anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion legal challenges that are happening right now. And so my question is, um, what are the risks in this moment um, to the implementation of IRA from these legal challenges? And how can we as community uh, climate activist organizations and philanthropy uh, respond to these challenges? Besides crying. Besides okay. crying. <laughs> wanted to make sure that was off the table. So I, I'm an engineer. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. And I worked with EPA lawyers that are very, very conservative. 
um, and are and but they're not as concerned as I am about all this. I'm hopeful that there's ways around. I think we also have to come together when we're attacked. So when we get a hostile letter from Congress or when somebody starts asking for documents and information, I think we need to share that with each other and be like, oh, you did this? Oh, you did that? Oh, that person's just running for re-election and they needed to do something mean. Um, but I, I have to trust that these super, super conservative lawyers are not freaking out as much as me as a lay person in this space. And I'll just say, like, I wrote down after our conversation, like, oh, look up that webinar with those four people. And because I think I'm glad you guys have some resources coming your way and some legal support, but um, there's, there's always, you know, more people that have uh, additional thoughts. But I don't know. When I think about like, implementation I, I, like, I think I think in frameworks. So like implementation is like funding flowing through a container, ultimately getting to its end user, um, which in this case are consumers, our local governments, um, our states. And as I'm thinking about like the equitable implementation, um, I think about how accessible are the programs uh, that are in those containers, and then how are the people, how are the end users, how, how well do the end users know about that program or that container, and how empowered do they feel in applying, because um, a lot of this is application funding. And so, you know, I think, you know, I know you, Emerald Cities is doing a lot, um, work with Sonia quite a bit, love Sonia. Uh, and others in the room are also doing a lot to ensure that those containers are as accessible uh, and equitable as possible. Uh, but then, you know, this is part of like the race that we're in. And the equitable implementation, in my mind, are is there a, a are there a di is there a diverse group of people that are accessing resources? And to do that, people need to know about them. And oftentimes, you know, I feel like everyone in this room knows as well, like early adopters are people who just know about resources earlier. And so what can we do to make sure that that isn't the case or that those people are, are still learning about these resources earlier, but that the, the people at the end of the spectrum are also learning about these resources earlier. Uh, and so that's where a lot of the hard work is. And that's what I know that you all are doing, Emerald City, C40. Um, but that's where I feel like we can kind of sidestep the legal challenges if we just get enough people from these communities aware of these resources and encourage and empower them to take action. But that's not that's not easy. <laughs> and so neither path is easy. <laughs> but I think one uh, ha one is a legal path and one is not. Uh, and so what, how can we leverage all the pathways that we have? All right, I think we have time for one more question and then we're gonna close it off. Well, um, I'm Charity Twos. Um, thank you to Rockefeller and to you all and BU. I have two questions. Um, so I'm gonna just like plant them and then um, on this kind of, I guess what's coming up for me is this idea of like information apartheid and like there's people who utilize tax language like the IRA and understand um, capital stacks and equity and how these things work. Um, and then th we have this aspirational goal of community-based organizations to really access this stuff and to frontline communities. And, and I've been hearing for quite some time narrative change narrative change, community ambassadors. And I'm curious, so this is question number one, like who's leading in that narrative change, especially with the data that just came out in this survey? Um, so that's one. Number two is this idea of, um, of local opposition. 
So one of the groups that I work with went through a year-long process of getting EJ communities to the table, getting 7,000 different public comments to win this $150 million award, a like an organization led by tribal women put in place, ready to sign the contract. And um, a fossil fuel group sued the state and the program went away. And so now they have to restart that process um, likely for another year. And so I'm curious about the resources to support state actors that are, that are really coming from, that, from the communities that we're talking about and want to fund community groups for their clean energy at, who are faced with the biggest impact from climate issues when they re experience this type of opposition. And this, this is in Oregon. So, you know, those are my questions. Thank you. I know, I have unsatisfactory answers to that charity, but I do wanna connect with you on that project because I think we might have some resources to help in that moment. Um, it, if I may, um, yeah. hi Charity, I'm Lisa Phillips and I work at the Columbia Climate School and I'm also here with another hat representing the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. We actually have an initiative called the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative, which actually works to connect with environmental frontline organizations who are facing opposition for putting renewable energy facilities in their communities. So would have would be very happy to connect with you after this um, and for anyone else who's interested. Thanks. I don't know if there's other audience members that also have resources specific to Charity's question. It's all about community. Right? <laughs> um, while you're thinking about that, yeah, I, again, like, I, this, none, of, none of this surprises me, sadly. And again, doing this in an equitable way that's community driven with all this crazy opposition and polarization I'll make a plug for BU's paper. It's kind of interesting that not, like you said, not all partisan politics are gone when you get to the municipal level, but they're much more about humans, right? And so when, back to Peter's question, like we, we don't, in our line of work, we're not convincing people that this is something that they want. They come to us and say, this is something we want. Can you help us do it? And so I think all the various technical assistance providers are trying to, to break that divide of information, to combat misinformation certainly as well, but to empower um, the folks that know the solutions and, and have known it for a really long time. But these kinds of studies like BU did gives us data and fuel, you know, to to advocate, to show we're not alone in this. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, Lisa spoke up there about those resources. I think one of your questions was who's leading on the information narrative change? I think it really just depends on where you are. I don't, I don't know that any one entity is leaning on it. I know that we're all involved in it. Um, you know, there are folks involved in it at the federal level folks involved in it at the state level, folks involved in it at the local level. And in, in, in most ways, I think that it's better it's better that way because the narrative changes are shifting and changing with that local context. So I don't know, but it, I would love to connect with anyone who's working on that. Or if you, if you find someone that is leading on that, I would love to connect with them too. Okay. Thank you all. All right, so some closing remarks from folks. Um, Anyone wants to give us the first bow? We have three <laughs> bows here. Go ahead, Michelle. Find somebody you don't know in this room and introduce yourself. So also go find Anya Schoolman from Solar United. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just end with kind of what Jamal said from my standpoint. Like we all are positioned to help a tiny sliver. Um, so let's try to approach this with as little ego as possible, meet as many people, um, and get the work done. 
yeah, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for your, thank the Rockefeller Foundation for hosting Menino uh, Institute for the survey. Uh, I hope that it drives the, ch the type of change that I know I want to see in the world. And I'll just leave with a question, which is like, how are each of you uh, being courageous in your own life and also being courageous uh, to drive the type of change that I know you all want to see too? Awesome. Um, okay, and then on my end, I just want to thank the Boston University Initiative on Cities for all of your hard work, um, including uh, Stacy. I know you spent countless hours with me over the last few months, uh, so thank you. <laughs> And thank you for sharing your birthday with us today. Thank you. Exactly. Happy birthday. This is this is the type of gift she's into. Um, and then, and you know, just a couple of other folks in the room uh, that you know. First of all, everyone who traveled here really appreciate it, um, and just came to spend um, a few hours with us today. Really appreciate that. Um, second, make sure you do not leave without eating. If you have not eaten, please. There's food. Do the thing, please. Um, Third, uh, please make sure, as Michelle alluded to, connect with folks here. There are folks here working in different parts of that ecosystem, um, from financing to data tracking to all of the things. Just make sure you connect with someone new. So I echo that. And then I just want to give a quick shout out to some of the other folks, um, like Rachel Isakov, who's on our team here, who has been instrumental in pulling this event together. Uh, from making sure that I didn't sound completely lost today to making sure that we had the right people on the panel to just thinking about, you know, pulling it all together. So really appreciate the, the support there. Um, and I know Sierra walked out, but Sierra Coleman is also on our team. She may be around. So if you need some other folks within Rockefeller Connect to make sure you connect with her and our events team, um, including Audrey, um, Chris and the team, you all are absolutely remarkable. Thank you for all your help today. So thank you all. That's it. Go chat, go eat, let's do the things.